me tell you a bit about the speaker before we get going. So Dr. Cleophis LaRue, he is the Francis Landy Patton Professor of Homiletics and the Chair of the Department of Practical Theology at Princeton Theological Seminary. Uh, he received his BA and MA from Baylor University, his Master of Divinity and PhD from Princeton Seminary. He specializes in the theory and method of African American preaching and worship. He's an ordained minister in the National Baptist Convention of America. And uh, he's a former pastor of two churches in Texas, as well as a former interim pastor of churches in Harlem and Jamaica, Queens, New York. He's a frequent speaker at churches, seminaries, and conferences throughout the country, and is a member of the Academy of Homiletics. Uh, we are honored to have him here. Let me just list a few of his publications. Uh, there is a book that is on the way called Color Preaching, The Shape of Christian Proclamation in the Global South. Uh, but he's also written other books, such as I Believe I'll Testify, Reflections on African American Preaching, uh, that came out in 2010. More Power in the Pulpit, How America's Most Effective Black Preachers Prepare Their Sermons. Uh, he was the editor for that, that came out in 2009. Uh, he also wrote the New Interpreter's Handbook of Preaching, this is my story, Testimonies and Sermons of Black Women in Ministry. He was the editor of that. Power in the Pulpit, uh, which was volume one to that second book I listed, and The Heart of Black Preaching. Uh, as you can tell, we have a uh, renowned scholar uh, and a well-known, well-respected preacher here. And uh, so I want to just let you give him a round of applause as he approaches this pulpit. And, uh, give him Good evening to you. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Okay. I teach uh, preaching homiletics, we call it, at Princeton Seminary, and I always say to the students at Princeton when you're preaching, you must remember there are people out there who make eye contact and you also make some passionate contact with them so that you begin the communication process tell them, for those of you who have trouble making eye contact with people, go on the corners at, at, at Princeton now, on the corners of Route 1, we have uh, people selling uh, newspapers. They stand at the busy crossroad and they sell primarily Sunday morning papers. And when you stop at that red light, they look you right in the eye. You want to know if you want a paper or not. They don't look beyond you, they look right at you. I say, I take the paper, but they make eye contact. So the people who sell papers on the corners are better at eye contact and communication than some of the preachers we said that. So, good evening to you and thank you for responding. I'm conscious of the uh, I'm conscious of the time, and I felt wonderful walking in here tonight. I, I, I'm paraphrasing, but uh, as we walked in, a young woman said to uh, her professor, Professor Williams. I'm here tonight for extra credit. <laughs> well, that makes me feel very wonderful. <laughs> but that's fine. The truth will set you free. <laughs> so, it's attributed to Mark Twain, I've heard it in other venues, but Mark Twain said a, a, a good speech ought to be like a decent woman's dress, short enough to be interesting, but long enough to cover the subject. So I want to give what I hope will be a good speech tonight according to Mark Twain, cover it as best I can, given the time frame. The shape of Christianity in the 21st century. It's a broad subject do my best in 30 minutes. The shape of Christianity in the 21st century. It is indeed that I thank Professor Williams and that I, that I, that I thank the dean here for the invitation to come. I'm trying to get into the lecture, but thank you for the invitation to come. I've been to this college before, uh, some years ago, but I'm always glad to come this way, so thank you. It is indeed a rapidly changing world out there. 
Rabbi Jonathan Sachs in his book, The Dignity of Difference, has rightly noted that the changes through which we have lived have been the most rapid and dramatic in the history of humankind. The 20th century alone saw technical advance at a rate that has no precedence. A single century, the 20th century, saw the birth of the television. When I was a little boy, we didn't have TV. I remember when it came to our house. The birth of the television, the computer, the internet, the laser beam. I'm trying not to stop because I have 30 minutes, but I have to stop a little bit and talk about the internet for just a, a, a moment. In 1990, a book was published, um, Mega Trends 2000 or something like that. Mega Trends 2000. It was a book on futurality. It was a book talking about the uh, future of the world uh, in 2000 and beyond. Now this book on future theology had a critical word missing from it. It never mentioned the word. Published in 1990, talking about the future, and never mentioned this word. What is the word? Internet. Never, never mentioned. And it was a book about the future. Mm. Mm. <laughs> And can we imagine our lives now without the internet? <laughs> I think not. But in 1990, a book on futurology, talking about what would be in the future, never mentioned the word internet. Thank God for Al Gore. <laughs> a single century. Saw the birth of the television, the computer, the internet, the laser beam, the credit card. Artificial intelligence, satellite communication, organ transplantation, and microsurgery. Journeys that used to take months today take hours. We get there so quickly now that we have to talk about jet lag. We have sent space probes to distant planets, photographed the birth of galaxies, fathomed the origins of the universe, and decoded the biological structures of life itself. The frontiers of human possibility extend daily. It is a rapidly changing world out there. Even within the confines of the United States, it's a rapidly changing world. In this country alone, every eight seconds, an American is born. Every 12 seconds, an American dies. Every 25 seconds, an immigrant is added to this country from overseas. And, as you certainly know by now, blacks are no longer the nation's largest minority group. Hispanics are now the largest minority group in the country and growing for they far outpace black families in childbirth rates. Jose is the number one name for baby boys in Texas, number two in Arizona, and number three in California. While Smith remains the most common name in the United States, is there anyone here named Smith? I have a very common name, all right. While Smith rem remains the most common name in the United States, the top 50 names now include Garcia, Martinez, Rodriguez, Fernandez, Lopez, Gonzalez, and Perez. <laughs> say it with an accent, okay, because it is better than that, or raise, okay. <laughs> Americans are as likely today to live in a big city, but the chances are greater that the city will be in the south or the west. Sorry, but the northeast is not growing. Churches are growing most heartily in these areas of the country, the south and the west. If you live in the south, or the western part of the country and you don't have any building plans on the drawing board, then you're probably not preparing for the future. If you build it, they will come because they will already be there. What do the changing demographics portend for America, for her churches and their ministries? William Frey in his book, Diversity Explosion, says America reached an important milestone in 2011 when for the first time in the history of the country, 
more minority babies than white babies were born in a year. In 2011, more minority babies than white babies were born in America. Soon, in America, most children will be racial minorities. Hispanics, blacks, Asians, and other non-white races. Whenever I give these stats, I always tell whites in America, don't worry, we will always have white people in America, always, not going anywhere. But there will be other people at the table. Hispanics, blacks, Asians, and other non-white races. And says Frey, in about three decades, <clears throat> whites will constitute a minority of all Americans. This milestone signals the beginning of a transformation from the mostly white baby boom culture that dominated the nation during the last half of the 20th century to the more globalized, multiracial country that the United States is becoming. These dramatic shifts in demographics signal some key changes of which we should all be aware. Number one, we will continue to see the rapid growth of new minorities, mainly Hispanics, Asians, and increasingly multiracial populations. During the next 40 years, each of these groups is expected to more than double. Second, we will see the sharply diminished growth and rapid aging of America's white population. In roughly 10 years, the white population will begin a decline that will continue into the future. This decline will be most prominent among the younger white populations. Why? Because they are not having babies like these other groups. At the same time, the existing white population will age rapidly as the large baby boom generation advances into seniorhood. Baby boomers are defined as those born between 1946 and 1964 probably your parents or maybe your grandparents, 46 to 64, they're baby boomers, and, and we baby boomers have started to retire. Three, there will be black economic advances and migration reversals. The long-standing great migration of blacks from the south has now turned into a wholesale evacuation from the north. There was a time when blacks left the south in droves, especially at the beginning of the, of the 20th century, and through World War I, World War II, they left the South in droves looking for better lives, uh, more employment, trying to get away from the segregationist South. They went north to Chicago, uh, to New York, uh, Jersey. Uh, they went west to California. Now that is reversing, and blacks are returning to the South. The cost of living is cheaper, and they have land and property, and they're going back to the South. For, in the future, we will see a shift toward an America in which no racial group is the majority. In the future, we will see a shift toward an America in which no racial group is the majority. In 2010, 22 of the nation's 100 largest populations were minority white. 22 of the nation's largest populations were minority white. Sometime after 2040, Frey predicts there will be no racial majority in the country. These changing demographics will undoubtedly reshape Christianity in the United States in ways in which we can only begin to imagine. And as you know what's happening in the country, these changing demographics, some people find them threatening and fearful. And you see and you hear them on TV saying, we want our country back. We held an election, who took it? We, we, but they are fearful, they are frightened by the changing demographics. So what's going to happen? First of all, these changing demographics are going to change the kinds of people who will show up on our church doorsteps. It's going to change the kinds of people who show up on our church doorsteps. A neighborhood in central Jersey where I live has recently undergone a demographic shift from majority white to Hispanics, blacks, and Asians. They moved into the neighborhood. 
A sensitive pastor who is trying to help the church mediate the change and grow comfortable with the new reality <coughs> said that the young blacks, Hispanics, and Asians were ready for the church, but the church was not ready for them. Second, what will changing demographics do to church budgets and long-range planning? As baby boomers retire, they no longer have the high levels of income they once had, and thus they are no longer able to contribute to the church as they once did. And as we are witnessing, Generation Xers and Millennials, that will be you, uh, will no longer feel as dedicated to the church as institution as their parents are and were. Millennials no longer tied to the church as institution. They don't have the love for a place, a church building, edifice that their parents and grandparents did. And so who's going to pay the mortgage and who's going to keep the property up and who's going to... And on and on we could go trying to think through the changes of these shifting demographics in a fast moving world. What should we do when these changes come into our neighborhood? Shall we go out and minister to these new people? Or shall we circle the wagons and insist that if they join us at all, they must assimilate. We don't mind you coming into the church, but you must become like us. Or shall we take incarnation seriously and deal with the God who comes to us in particularity in every generation? In other words, do we have the courage, the faith, and the fortitude to say, what new thing is God doing among us? James Neiman and Thomas Rogers in their book, Preaching to Every Pew, say this is the challenge facing many preachers today. More and more American preachers are finding themselves in congregations and communities loaded with enormous cultural diversity. And what is more, that training in preaching, whether in the classroom or following the example of a mentor, has often left them ill-prepared to take up this challenge in new and creative ways. That they are just not ready for diversity. And this is not just whites. This is true of the groups, period. There are black churches asking, who are these new people coming into the congregation and they are not black? What shall we do with them? And equally, it is the case that there are predominantly white churches saying, what are we going to do with these new people moving into the community who are not like us? At uh, Princeton Seminary in our preaching class, you take preaching in your second year of seminary work, and that first sermon, we have all of the preachers to preach from the same biblical passage. That first sermon, we assign them the same passage. And what we want them to do, we want them to hear how context changes the way we hear the gospel. It gives a different emphasis. Uh, and some will say, I've never heard that passage interpreted like that. Is, is that. is that correct? And we try to help them to see that there are any number of ways to interpret a passage and still be faithful to the underlying essence of the passage and its theology. So the relevant question for preaching today, for preaching today is this. How to speak beyond one's own cultural home and proclaim the gospel across the boundaries of ethnicity, class, and religious difference. They also note, I'm talking about Neiman and Rogers, they also note that this challenge is nothing other than the missionary drive of the church since its very beginnings. Had not the first believers been effective at preaching amid those who were different from themselves, the church would not have endured beyond that first generation. When Christianity first started out, it was a regional religion right there in Galilee and places like that. So a fisherman on the order of Simon Peter was sufficient. But when God prepared to introduce Christianity to the civilized world, he called forth an international gospel globe trotter named St. Paul. Sherry Turkle in her book Alone Together says, technology has reality on the run. Turkle goes on to describe how technology offers us substitutes for connecting with each other face to face. 
So the question becomes, why do we turn to technology so often and why are we so captivated by it for such long periods of time? Many turn to technology out of loneliness. But at the same time they are lonely, they are also fearful of intimacy. So a part of technology's appeal is that our networked lives allow us to hide from each other, even as we are tethered to one another. Uh, Richard Lisher at Duke Divinity School, Richard Lisher wrote a book entitled The End of Words. Lisher chides the preacher for substituting technology for the spoken word. He believes that the use of technology, which he defines as light shows, videos, and PowerPoint presentations on Sunday morning, that accompany the Sunday sermon, especially in the large mega churches. A mega church is a church with 2,000 plus active members on the road. He says this is especially true in mega churches that we have these, these, these light technological displays, light shows, videos, PowerPoints. He said it represents a fundamental lack of confidence in the spoken word of God. That technology is pushing us away from this kind of contact. Uh, Lisher's critique of the place of technology in preaching draws the sternest rebuke from my young students who have to read his book for one of their class assignments. Any number of them could be classified as digital natives, people between the ages of five and early 20s who've grown up on technology. Uh, digital natives, when I have them in class, they resist Lisher's words. They, they, he receives that sternest rebuke from them. Uh, they say, digital natives, they say the use of technology does not strike them in any way as doing a disservice to the gospel, but rather they see it as furthering the good news that the gospel promises. Why? Because technology is their world, and technology is not Lisher's world. So any kind of technological device that you use, Lisher thinks you are trying to get away from this spoken word, and yet the young people like yourselves Turkle calls you digital natives. You've grown up with this technology. And so for you, it becomes a way to communicate, not something to avoid communication. But Turkle and others who are a generation or two removed from the digital natives see Facebook, MySpace, Twitter, and you know all the others, and I'm trying to keep up with them, <laughs> and other types of social media. Uh, what's the Facebook guy's name? Yeah, I read in the New York Times where he is now urging people to read books. Not just stay on Facebook, but to, but to actually read books. At Princeton, we're having difficulties getting students to read books. We just built a new $75 million library. And we're moving to a digital age. I'm wondering who's going to be there to fill it up. But anyway. Turkle and others who are a generation or two removed from the digital natives see Facebook, MySpace, Twitter, and other types of social media as offering us the illusion of companionship without the demands of friendship. We'd rather text than talk. This is especially true of teenagers. A Nielsen study a few years ago, I imagine the number is higher now, but a Nielsen study a few years ago reported that the average teen sends over 3,000 text messages a month. I was at the mall the other day and there were four or five teens sitting right there in the common area and they were texting. They were texting. And I was waiting on my friend and once I discovered it, that they were texting one another. <laughs> and they were right there. That I don't understand. Okay, you'll have to help me in the Q&A. <laughs> The average teen sends over 3,000 texts a month. But it is also the case that more and more adults are also coming to prefer the keyboard over the human voice. It is more efficient, we say. Lisher would say technology contributes, contributes to the decline of the spoken word. Another thing for the church to consider going forward, how best to get the message out. 
in this age of technological advance. To what extent should technology be used in service to the gospel? Does it promote or obfuscate the good news? I use that word because you're in college, uh, and, and words matter. Uh, I was preaching in North Carolina, and a young man met me at the door and said, my God, I need a dictionary to listen to you preach. I said, good, go get one. <laughs> A young preacher asked me at a conference one day how he could grow deeper in his preaching. But even as he asked the question, his technological gadgetry was going off. His Bluetooth was buzzing in his ear, his iPad was flashing, and his Fitbit was processing data through his wrist. Technology says, Turtle, I'm not opposed to any of these things. I have my phone in my pocket and my Fitbit on it. I'm not opposed. I'm just making observations tonight. Flashing and his Fitbit was processing down through his wrist. Technology, says Turkle, ties us up even as it promises to free us up. Even though we are increasingly connected to one another, we are at the same time more alone than ever. Why? Because we have come to expect more from technology and less from one another. Maybe Lisher is on to something about the way we communicate. Lynn Sweet. In his book, The Three Hardest Words in the World to Get Right, that's a pretty long title. The Three Hardest Words in the World to Get Right. Lynn Sweet said, a doctor friend of his, who often attended to people near death, said the 11 words the dying person most wanted to hear were these words. A doctor friend of Sweet's, who attended to people in their dying hours, said over time he came to recognize that there were 11 words the dying person most wanted to hear from his friends and loved ones as he or she lay near death. What were those words? I'll miss you. Thank you. I forgive you. And the last three words were what? I love you. And Sweet said, of the 11 words that they most wanted to hear, the three words they most wanted to hear were, I love you. And yet, says Sweet, those are the words that we find most difficult to say to one another. All right, hurry on here. The jury is still out on the impact technology will have in the future on those described as digital natives, our young people from the ages of five to their early twenties, who have grown up on cell phones and robotic toys that ask for love. We are now looking, says Turkle, for our robots to say, I love you. It is a rapidly changing world out there, not just within the confines of the United States. Oh, no man or person is an island unto himself or herself. We now live in a global village and whatever affects one of us affects all. Those of us who live in the United States live in an unbelievable world of privilege when you think about how most of us live and how the rest of the world lives. Those of us who live in the United States live in an unbelievable world of privilege. The average North American consumes five times more than a Mexican, 10 times more than a Chinese, and 30 times more than an Indian. Most of the world's population live on less than $2 per day. Consider this, 1.3 billion people live below the poverty line in the world. 840 million are malnourished. 800 million are without access to medical care. And 1 billion people lack adequate shelter. Another 2.6 billion people go without sanitation in the world, and we take a flushing toilet for granted. 150 million children are malnourished, food insecurity. 150 million children didn't have enough to eat today. And please listen to this, 30,000 children die in this world every day from preventable diseases. 
30,000. Several years ago, Rabbi Sachs reported that 65% of the world's population had never made a phone call. Of course, that's changing, trust me, with, with the cell phone companies around the world. And says Sachs, another 40% have no access to electricity. If we are not careful, we will not even be able to communicate with the majority of Christians in the world in the 21st century. For right now, today, the language of the majority of Christians in the world in which we live is not English, it's not German, it's not French, it's none of the languages required to get a PhD. The number one, the language most often spoken by a majority of Christians today is Spanish. Since 1980, 35 years ago, Spanish has been the leading language of church membership in the Christian world, with Chinese, Hindi, and Swahili right behind. Latin American nations are among the world's greatest producers and consumers of Bibles, above all Brazil. And while the language there is Portuguese, it is still a part of Latin America. We have to be conscious of that broader world that is out there and know that we have a part in it. Why? Because the future of Christian preaching, the future of Christianity, will be shaped by that world. Now let me read this second part and I shall stop. Will that, will that be all right? Oh, okay, well, you know, when people know you're going to stop in a minute, they, they sit and listen a little bit more. I'm going to quit in just a few minutes, but I want to get these things to you. <laughs> the future shape of preaching. Colored preaching, by which I mean preaching done by people of color, is the preaching that will be heard by a majority of the Christian world in the 21st century. Colored preaching. Philip Jenkins, in his book, The Next Christendom, predicts that by the year 2050, by the year 2050, what is that, 35 years from now? You'll be in your prime. By the year 2050, the majority of Christians will be people of color, living primarily in the southern hemisphere. Christianity, says Jenkins, is turning brown and moving south. Many think that the future of preaching lies with conservative churches and the massive numbers of people they are able to draw on Sunday mornings, but the future vitality of Christianity will lay in part with people of color who will be living primarily in the southern hemisphere. Christianity is in decline, most certainly in Western Europe, I'm getting ahead of myself, in Western Europe, and it jumped upon to America, but it is growing below the equator, in what we call the global south, Latin America, Asia, and Africa. They, according to European missiologist Andrew Walls, will be the Christian majority, and they will set the theological agenda. From all indications, the colored preaching of the future will be quite different from the traditional preaching of the West. The kinds of preaching that will shape the future of Christianity will no longer lie solely in the Western worlds of Europe and North America. Where <coughs> the Pope come from? Where is Pope Francis from? Argentina. The global south, the Catholic Church is on to the movement of Christianity. And this Pope is transforming the world. He seems to have a feel for where Christianity is going. and He's trying to open the Catholic Church. He has his work uh, cut out this very wonderful church that has been around for ages, but the cardinals recognized, I think, where Christianity was headed. And so the Pope didn't come from Europe. This Pope didn't come from Europe. This Pope comes from Argentina, from the global south. The preaching of the 21st century will be comparably changed by immersion in the prevailing cultures where Christianity will thrive, mainly Latin America, Asia, Africa. Andrew Walls, in a recent article entitled Christian Scholarship and the Demographic Transformation of the Church, made note of what he termed the most remarkable feature of Christian history in the 20th century. What was it? The massive demographic and cultural shift in the composition of the Christian Church. Europe, Europa, says Walls, is no longer a Christian heartland, and North America is becoming subject to the same pressures. By the end of the 21st century, two-thirds of the world's Christians may be living in the southern continents, 
Africa, Latin America, and some parts of Asia have now become the Christian heartlands. What are the implications of this? According to Walls, the implication is that Africa and Asia and Latin America and the Pacific seem set to be the principal theaters of Christian activity in its latest phase. What happens there will determine what the Christianity of the 21st and 22nd centuries will be like. What happens in Europe and even in North America where we live will matter less and less. It is Africans and Asians and Latin Americans who will be the representative Christians. This is Walls. Those who represent the Christian norm, the Christian mainstream of the 21st and 22nd centuries. What happens to preaching when it is being shaped by people in the global south? It could become more experiential and less inclined to rationalistic, discursive thought where one engages in intellectual assent more so than heartfelt religion. Formal theology is struggling because many people today are saying that the typical theology is moribund and not addressing the needs of the world. There will also likely be more emphasis on transcendence, the supernatural, healing, a belief in the devil, acceptance of gifts of the spirit, and so forth. Pentecostalism is the fastest growing wing of Christianity in the global south. It's also growing here. Now, I'm going to stop there, and I'm just, just let me say this. What the shape of Christianity, as you've heard me say, is definitely going to be affected by demographics in the United States, where no minority will be able to claim majority. It will be affected by diversity, because we're going to have not only whites, but we're going to have Hispanics, Asians, and blacks, and multiracials coming into our community. We're already here into our churches. We are going to be affected by technological advances. We're going to be affected by Christianity being primarily a religion of the global south. And what will be the place of young people like yourselves in that particular church? That is the question. Here's what we're finding about young people, and I'll stop. That the young people are looking for churches of toleration. The studies show that they are less inclined to attend intolerant churches. Churches that have a problem with diversity. Churches that have a problem with otherness. Churches who get hung up on things they take for granted in their world. But statistics also show that young people like yourselves are going to be concerned with the environment, with this world that God has given to us, that you are taking our abuse of this good world seriously, and that you want to do something about it. If I may say so, this hegemonic grip, big word for this leadership, this, this leadership grip that has been true, no offense, of white Western males, that grip has to be lessened if Christianity is going to survive. It was processed as normative, universal, when we all know that even though it was a dominant uh, strand of Christianity, it was still coming from a perspective. <coughs> We all come to faith with particular pre-understandings. No one comes tabula rasa with a clean slate. We all come affected by our context. So that grip has to be lessened. And there are any number of multicultural churches in the United States that are thriving. I mean, they purposely have people on their staff and in leadership who are different. Blacks, whites, Asians, multiracial, purposely. Uh, the United Methodists are also doing some of this. The United Church of Christ is also uh, doing uh, some of this. I know uh, the Nazarenes have, have diversity. Uh, I, I'm not sure, so I'm not making any comment because I don't have the facts. You could have diversity and not inclusivity. Just because you have people of different 
races, ethnicities and all in the organization does not mean that they are in critical places in leadership. And that's what I mean by inclusivity. So the hegemonic grip has to be loosened because they're just, it's just a different world. No person will have the, no group will have the majority of the minority status. You'll have a plurality, but not a majority. So when that opening comes, in, and we're all to an extent threatened by difference until we can get uh, uh, used to it. But the young people are really driving this thing. I, I wish I could really speak openly to you. The young people are really driving change in the United States, okay? Because uh, you and uh, people a bit older will, and younger, will be known as the old generation. And what I mean by that, you'll be known as the Obama generation. Whatever you think about Mr. Obama, it was quite a feat on the part of this country to elect Mr. Obama as the first African-American president. Now, in 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years, when another person of color becomes the president of the United States, the people in the old generation will say, what's the big deal? When I was young, we had a black president, so what? But none of us could say that until this most recent time. So young people will be driving uh, this, this openness that we're talking about. Those who refuse to change, who refuse to open up, will in effect have this bird of life in their hands. And they're going to smother uh, this bird. There are other people at the table, but you do have a place in this world. And you do have a part to play in this world. And people like myself and your day here, we're turning this world over to you. And what will you do with it when it is your responsibility to lead it? And what will you do with this faith that we are passing on to you? Thank you for listening to me tonight.